actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more and become more. You are a leader. These are the thoughts shared by leading author Simon Sinek in his book, Leaders Eat Last. Indeed, a true leader inspires others through his actions and through his behavior. And today we shall engage in a conversation with one such leader. I'm your host Deepti Divan and I welcome all you dear viewers to another promising episode of the Economic Times Cutting Chai Stories, brought to you by ET Edge. Today we shall have a candid conversation with our guest about his life story, his education and training, his professional journey, his experiences and learnings, and a little bit about his interests and hobbies. We are delighted to have with us Mr. Chetan Garg, Managing Director, Allstate India. Chetan is an accomplished, results-oriented global leader with 30 plus years of diverse experience. He has been recognized as one of India's best leaders in times of crisis by the Great Place of Work Institute. And under his leadership, Allstate India has been recognized as a kin-centric best employer and by Economic Times as one of best workplaces for women employees. Chetan is a reputed industry speaker and a visiting faculty for courses in investment banking and insurance and is a certified executive coach. So thank you so much for joining us, Chetan, and welcome to Cutting Chai Stories. Thank you, Dipti. I'm very humbled by your introduction. Uh, I hope I can live up to it. Well, absolutely, Chetan. Uh, it's our pleasure to have you here. Join us and uh, tell us about your story. So uh, let's start at the very beginning. Uh, you've studied at St. Xavier's School and uh, then you did your Bachelor's of Engineering. So if you were to go back to these uh, early years of your childhood, your school or college, did you have any positive influences or any incidents that have uh, helped you become the person that you are today? Absolutely, Dipti. Um, so I went to St. Xavier's High School, which is got a 150 year history. Uh, this is in Dhobitalao in Mumbai, in the central part of Mumbai. Um, amazing experience, fantastic teachers, uh, classmates that I learned a lot from. So I'm still in touch with many of them, thanks to WhatsApp and all the new technology, but absolutely great time. Uh, during my college years, my engineering college, we were among the first batch that started. And that was an experience in itself. Uh, we were trying to help set up the college from scratch virtually, uh, helping with things like setting up the library, setting up the basic facilities, infrastructure, working with the management and the teachers there. And I think that taught me a lot in terms of how do you work, collaborate with people across the board, right from the president of our, uh, of our institute. Uh, by the way, this is D.Y. Patel College of Engineering and D.Y. Patel Stadium, we all know where the IPL matches are being held. So it's part of that uh, August institution and working with Mr. D.Y. Patel himself on many occasions to be able to set up the structure, the organization, I very often even go and meet professors to bring them into our college and things. So a huge learning exp experience at a pretty tender age, I thought. Wow, that is excellent. So, so you've been associated with some of the best institutions uh, that uh, Mumbai City has to offer. And uh, also, uh, I think you learned your people skills uh, pretty early on then in that case. And we'll talk more about your people skills later. Now, um, we'll talk about your career. We all uh, uh, when you started working before uh, Allstate, you've uh, been associated with SunGuard, with uh, Northern Trust, TCS, Deutsche Bank, and uh, many more companies. So uh, could you tell us about the initial steps that you took in your career? And um, do you remember your initial job, your first job or your first salary? And uh, take us through the early years of uh, how you started your career journey. Sure. So my first job was in a sales job. Um, I did my engineering and I wanted to experiment and do something different. So my first real job, I would say, was in a sales uh, experience, selling consulting and other services. Um, this was the Mafatlal Group. And um, I tried it for some time, but I, I didn't really, really enjoy it. While there's a lot of glamour in terms of travel and stuff like that, I thought it wasn't for me because I wasn't using my technology skills that I'd learned over the last previous four years. Um, I then uh, worked with Philips initially and Philips and their technology group. But then soon after I joined uh, Deutsche Bank in Singapore. And that was in many ways my first real exposure to a deep, international corporate banking world. Um, it was a very different place altogether. 
uh, and it helped me in stretching myself and getting outside my comfort zone. I was in Singapore um, and working with a team and building software, uh, uh, banking product. Uh, and Deutsche Bank was building it out of Singapore and for its global market or for its enterprise-wide customers. Um, very different experience working with different cultures. So the Germans in Germany, the Germans in Singapore, Singaporean Chinese, Singaporean Indians. I think that was a very, very big learning experience in the form of how do you work across cultures, get things done, um, and create a win-win environment. So that was one big one. And I was in Singapore for about nine years after, uh, uh, as part of that period, working with various other institutions as well. I also joined Societe Generale there. And what I learned as part of my career journey is to be curious and to really ask questions rather than assume things, as well as to understand the business and get outside the pure technology area. Uh, in fact, in many occasions, I would work very closely with the business, uh, knowing I would like to think as much as they knew the business, but while building systems for them, ensuring that we are taking care of their business requirements, et cetera, as much as possible to have solutions that were good to run as they hit the ground, as they went to production. So I think all these experiences really taught me that the business is really where the rubber hits the road and how do we use our various other support areas like technology, operations, et cetera, to facilitate that. So that's the, one of my big takeaways from my early years. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, I think what I picked up from uh, what you just told us is that uh, A, you went out with a curious mind uh, without, uh, you know, withholding yourself back and you just, uh, you know, absorbed and learned whatever um, you could. And uh, also uh, working across different cultures, I think that must have given you great, great, great exposure. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And uh, we uh, move on now to uh, a perspective that a lot of people hold. Now, quite often people working in the IT domain are perceived to be very technical in their approach and uh, not having great people skills. Um, well, when I speak to you, I do not think of that uh, absolutely. And uh, before you answer, I'd like to mention a colleague of yours who worked with you as part of uh, the Allstate Roadside Assistance Program. And uh, he said, uh, and I quote, if you have not worked with Chetan, you have surely missed something. Now, clearly you do possess the people skills and you also mentioned that um, working across different cultures and also in your college days, you got the exposure to uh, you know, meet with different people and work with them and build teams. Now, um, how important do you think these skills are, people skills, and um, do you, to you, did it come naturally or over the years you've kept uh, developing on it? So, yes, I think a lot of technology folks are considered geeks, right? And I'm going to use the word which is slightly slangish, but that's the way a lot of people think of them. And they're very good in technology, but they need a more holistic perspective on things and a more a wider set of experiences. You know, it's unfortunate that in our educational system, we don't focus on leadership, leadership skills and what is often termed as soft skills, right? But to be successful in business in the real world, we need those skills a lot, whether it's negotiation, whether it's persuasion, whether it's uh, presentation skills and communication skills, uh, stakeholder management, how do you create a win-win environment? And I think all these are strong ingredients for a successful career, whatever career it be, whether it's technology, whether it's in other fields. Um, so I think a lot of us have learned it through observation, seeing others, interacting, experiencing, making mistakes and learning the hard way. Mm. We've also had some interventions from our respective companies where we get exposure to some of these programs and skills. But I personally think that there needs to be a strong focus on that to help uh, people across functions be more effective and successful. Um, I know in our organization today, we take it on us to ensure that we expose our employees to these skills through interventions, training programs, learning and development, et cetera. Um, in fact, one of the things that I've been working on at the, uh, at, across the industry uh, as part of NASCOM has also been, how do we inculcate these skills in our middle management for them to be successful? Um, so I think they are critical. I think without them, we will not be successful. We all learn in different ways, but if there was a more structured way to expose our employees to it, it would be much, much better. 
Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Chetan, you, I believe you have studied uh, negotiation skills and certain skills. Uh, if you could tell our viewers, uh, what, where did you study this and how could they go about uh, learning all this? You know, I was lucky. I had the privilege of attending a program at Kellogg's in the US. Okay. Um, and it was a three-week program sponsored by my organization, which also had negotiation skills in there. And we played some very interesting games yeah. to show how negotiation is really important. I mean, uh, very often we all want to win at the cost of somebody else, yeah. right? And that doesn't work. And it's got to be a win-win situation. How do you achieve that? In a, not with, through collusion, but in a practical way, right? And there's a term which uh, uh, I took away from that program called BATNA, B-A-T-N-A. -A. Okay. It stands for best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And basically it says, right, when you start negotiation, you know what your bottom is and you can't go below that bottom. And then you have some headroom and you play with the headroom, but you need to negotiate in a fashion that you leave something on the table for everyone. Uh, and then you have this bottom that below that you can't, you can't continue, you have to walk away, hmm. right? And so these are just some things I learned. There was a lady called Lay, and I forget her last name and she's written a few books as well. Amazing, amazing experience in just how do you interact and negotiate uh, across a wide variety of subjects. Wow. What did you say the term was? BATNA, B-A-T-N-A. BATNA. Okay. Best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Some great learning there for our viewers uh, who look up to you and uh, some great learning for me too. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Chetan, we'll now talk about your leadership style. So uh, how do you go about uh, building great teams and uh, keeping them motivated? What is your process like? And uh, as a leader, what is your approach? Um, also, do you see any place for spirituality or philosophy when it uh, comes to leadership? Sure. So let me take the first one first. My style is to be very hands-on and be grounded. So I walk the floor, I talk to my employees across levels where they sit and just ask them, what are you doing? Which part of the organization are you with? And how are things for you? How is it working? What ideas do you have? How can we become a better organization? And I think that gives me a good sense of the pulse of the organization. Hmm. It allows me to interact with people across levels. I know sometimes my employees may feel a bit uh, intimidated by, by the MD coming and talking to them, but I think over time they've also become very comfortable uh, in fact, I was asking some of my, co my colleagues or my, my directs uh, last week, hey, I've been doing this. Do you think it's okay? They said, absolutely. Don't ever stop doing it. That's wow. the best thing you can do in terms of just walking the floor and talking to employees on the ground. So I strongly believe in a flat structure, in active interaction, collaboration, mm -hmm. and servant leadership. Today, leadership is there to help our employees achieve what they can do based on their skills and experience. They are the real heavy lifters and leadership is creating a path for them to be successful and through them, the organization being successful. So I think in many cases, I look at the inverted pyramid and say the real doers are the junior folks and leadership is the bottom, trying to facilitate them and make things more practical. So these are a few things that I, I uh, focus on. I also believe in coaching and mentoring. Uh, in fact, uh, I did a course uh, the year before last on coaching for me to be an effective leader by coaching my employees in, a, in an objective way. Uh, everybody's got aspirations. How do we help them achieve those aspirations is important. Uh, again, it's to create a win-win for the employees and for the organization. Uh, and I think through coaching, there's a good way to help them achieve their goals as well as for the organization. In fact, I've, I've had the opportunity to coach a few people outside my organization as well and help them achieve their goals. So I think uh, coaching is something uh, which is important for everyone. We have often in the past heard of it as a stigma. Like some people may think, oh, if I need a coach, there's something wrong with me. No. In fact, most leaders today have a coach and they do very well with the coach. Actually, last week, I had the opportunity of being with uh, Marshall Goldsmith, who's a very well-known and the, probably the most well-known coach in the world. And he was in Bangalore and he took a session on his new book amazing experience. So yeah, I think coaching is the other piece where I want to help my, my teams. Great. So you uh, walk up to them, make sure that you're approachable, you speak to them, ask for their feedback, you um, try and mentor them and coach them so that we have more leaders like you in the long run. Um, and um, 
what is your take now i gathered that you do a lot of reading you do a lot of uh, uh, you know books uh, reading related to um, you know training etc what is your take on spirituality and uh, philosophy do you apply that um, to leadership or have you like kept away from that i think spirituality has a lot of great learnings for us in fact personally um, i think yoga just the practice of yoga is a very uh, useful skill um, it helps me a lot i do it three times a week if i can uh, and i have a teacher who does a class that nowadays on zoom uh, but just the aspect of getting in there and taking your mind off everything else and focusing on that aspect of yoga the various asanas um, and also pranayam etc is just very self healing um, and in addition to all the cardio stuff that happens and the flexibility etc it's a great exercise and it's fairly complete um, i think spirituality is a is important including things like meditation etc which allows us to calm down we are in a very hectic world and we don't have much time for ourselves we get caught in the rat race and right from the time we wake up with our mobile phones and emails and stuff to the time we go to bed we are caught in this we need to carve out some time and just reflect and think i think that's really important all right well uh, thank you so much for that and uh, now chetan i'll ask you something that is very specific to what uh, you have achieved during one of the most difficult challenges i'm talking about covid uh, here i'd like to once again mention that you have received the recognition for exemplary leadership through the pandemic and for sustaining a high trust high performance culture in the organization uh, during this challenging time so uh, pre covid to covid uh, has your approach towards uh, life family and the community changed and uh, did your leadership style change in any way during this time i think it did and if i reflect on it objectively before pandemic we just took so many things for granted there were high expectations i mean i'll be honest i was not a great believer of work from home hmm. okay and i felt that people need to be in the office interact etc and be effective but i think covid has shown that you can be fairly effective working from home as well and a hybrid model is probably the best balance uh, with people coming and meeting in the office having brainstorming sessions and innovative discussions but also working from home uh, for half the time and being effective in that work so that for me has been a big learning i think i've also become much more empathetic uh, overall and this was just a realization of how much everybody is going through during the pandemic whether it's our employees their families their parents their children it was it was really an eye opening experience and i think my organization along with my leadership team so i worked with my leadership team and we worked together we were aligned and we said right let's do the right thing for our employees let's make life easy for them let's help them and support them on the ground in fact we made many decisions as a team uh, on on the spot Uh, we even made our processes much easier streamlined to make decisions quickly there were cases where in some situations employees need some salary advances and within a few hours money was in their account they didn't have to go through a lot of approvals and process and take days and weeks to to make it happen i think those are the things that endeared our employees to us helped us become much more uh, effective as an organization employee centric and i think we've done a great uh, piece of employee support during the whole period when i say employees i mean employees their families uh, their parents whether it's vaccination whether it's hospitalization all kinds of stuff including food delivery to their houses wow well that's really commendable and uh, um you said that uh, the employees um, and that's what has led to the employees uh, you know trusting the organization so much and uh, hence uh, the much deserved award for you uh, so would you say that this has been the biggest challenge for you or uh, was there any other incident uh, that you would like to share with us that uh, you are very proud of uh, overcoming any any challenge throughout your career all the years that um, uh, you know were a big big challenge for you and look like a big uh, you know issue or problem but uh, you and your team uh, handled that and overcame that challenge anything that you would like to share with our viewers well i think in perspective the pandemic was the biggest one it came out of the blue with no planning no time to really think through and strategize the need to react uh, as well as 
think of everybody on the ground. So I haven't come across anything more serious than the pandemic in my experience. In fact, there's a, there's a, a, a saying that uh, one, of, one of my leaders shared with me and I thought it's very uh, good or very useful is, he said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Yeah. And, and crisis, they, they present challenges, but they also present opportunities. And for us, pandemic was also an opportunity to really get our resiliency as an organization up, to allow people to work from anywhere uh, at any point in time. It allowed us to, to test this hybrid working model, which worked effectively. It allowed us to create more leaders because we made each of our employees a leader from their seat. And we gave them opportunities to show their leadership skills. And I think we have a number of leaders now that we can see uh, mushrooming in the organization. Absolutely. Well, uh, we move on now, Chetan. As someone with so much experience, uh, we'd like to know your views on uh, this. According to you, where do Indian organizations stand currently when it comes to developing and onboarding cutting edge technology? So uh, what is your take on this? Where do the Indian organizations stand? Well, I think our, our Indian organizations, there's a whole mix, right? And if you think about... Uh, I'll leave the government group aside for a minute and just talk about the private enterprise. You know, within the private enterprise, there are more uh, tenured organizations like the, uh, like the banks, HDFC, ICICI, et cetera. And then there are more of the startups um, at this point. My sense is the startups have a natural muscle to try new things and be cutting edge. Uh, with the traditional organizations, they take more time, they're more risk averse in trying new technology, but that's true globally. It's not unique to India. Mm. Having said that, I think uh, more and more of the Indian organization are willing to take a risk to step out and try new stuff in a controlled fashion. And I've seen this happen with areas like analytics, uh, which are very big uh, opportunity areas across institutions. And companies have been trying things to try to uh, adapt or adapt it to their organization and apply it to their environment and get some benefits out of it. I'm seeing much more of the leadership willing to try it than stepping back and say, no, let somebody else do it. And then we'll come back as number two or number three. I think the culture in India is changing to be willing to take some risk. Very well said. Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing that and uh, speaking to us about anything that you would like to say to our audience uh, before we move on to the you know, lighter part, uh, anything that you wish to share? I would just uh, tell everyone to, to be curious and to be hungry, uh, to step out of their comfort zone, try new things. You know, failure is a step to success. Only when we fail and make mistakes will we learn right? And not to take failure or mistakes as something very serious uh, and get bogged down with it. Uh, so I would just encourage everyone, try things out. Who knows it's going to work? Absolutely. Well, uh, be curious and be hungry. Uh, words of wisdom by the expert himself. Uh, thank you so much once again. And uh, on a lighter note, uh, we would like to know how do you unwind and uh, if any interests or hobbies uh, of course, you have a busy schedule and you're involved in so many activities, uh, especially as a coach also, you're visiting faculty. So I'm not sure how much time, uh, spare time do you have? But even so, our um, audience would like to know um, any uh, interests or hobbies and also are there any items on your bucket list that are yet to be fulfilled? Lots. <laughs> and when I speak the time for it, again, the pandemic showed, showed how mortal we all are, right? With mm -hmm. so many cases happening, People who are healthy but still getting impacted by COVID just showed our mortality in, in a grim way and the need to attend to our interests. But let me start with the first part. So I like to unwind through a few things. I, I play a few sports. I play squash and I play table tennis. And whenever I get a chance on weekends especially, I indulge in both these things. And it's a great way to sweat it out and to just focus on what you're doing and forget everything else, right? So. It's a great way to unwind. I also am a foodie. So I like different kinds of cuisines and I like my wine. I've had the opportunity to taste wine in different geographies. I've been on wine tours in Australia, in France, in the US, uh, in India as well. So I just 
like having a good glass of red wine paired with some good food and that's a great evening for me. Uh, on your other question about, uh, sorry, what is your second question? Uh, the items on your bucket list. Oh yeah, my bucket list, how can I forget that, yeah. So a few things are there. One is I have this uh, dream of going to Machu Picchu in Peru, uh, that's there. And then also Mansarovar, um, it's been there for the last few years, it's got delayed and now with COVID, the two last few years also nothing happened, but both these are very high on my bucket list. Uh, and then there are a few things around spending a week in Rishikesh, doing some whitewater rafting and things like that. Um, and yeah, a few other things which are more practical and I want to do them in the next few years. Wow, amazing. Well, we hope that you get to do all that very soon. And uh, as a matter of fact, Rishikesh is one of my favorite places. I think the vibe there is just uh, absolutely great. And we hope you get to travel more and uh, swirl your wines and enjoy them. Thank so you. Now, Chetan, we quickly move on to the fun rapid fire questions. Um, these are very quick, short answers that you can give us. So, so are you ready for these? As ready as I probably can be. <laughs> All right. So tell us about your favorite city in the world. Which one is it? Um, between London and Singapore. London, just because of the vibrancy and the cultural mix, but the weather is pathetic, uh, keeps raining and is overcast. Singapore is a great city, which has a mix of many good things. Uh, also, actually, Chicago has grown on me a lot. Mm -hmm. I've been to Chicago a number of times and I find it's an amazing city. So these are three cities I really would love to live in. All right, lovely. Your favorite food item? Um, I like Thai food a lot. Uh, and um, there's the Tom Yum soup, which I love, Tom Yum Kung, which oh. is uh, with, with prawns. And uh, that's my favorite dish. Absolutely delicious. Uh, well, if you were stranded on an island for two days and you could choose only one of these items for company, what would you choose? A good book, a good movie, or a good piece of music? A good book. Okay. If you were granted one wish, what would you ask for? Having a peaceful life and being content with what I have. Okay, amazing. What is the best thing about the city you're residing in now? I believe you're in Bangalore. I'm in Bangalore. The weather is amazing. I wouldn't, uh, I mean, so this city has fantastic weather, 10 months of the year. Absolutely. Uh, green and I mean, besides the traffic, everything else works well. So what's the best thing about Bangalore? The people, the food or the weather? Um, I'd start with the weather because it's very unique. I haven't seen any other city of this scale and size uh, comparing itself on the weather front. Uh, the people are amazing, very warm, very easy to get along. And the food is great. The South Indian food here is amazing. Actually, it's got a great cuisine because international cuisine here is also very easily available. Right. So complete the sentence, life is incomplete without? without a good glass of wine oh lovely all right quickly this or that bangalore or bengaluru bangalore okay. beaches or mountains mountains summer or winter winter cutting chai or cutting chai with economic times cutting chai with economic times well, I'm glad you said that. Uh, we are happy that you would like to have your cutting chai with E.T. Thank you so, so much for this wonderful chat. Uh, I truly enjoyed this conversation and I'm positive that our viewers have enjoyed this as well and uh, will be inspired by this story. Thank you, Deepti. It was amazing. I enjoyed the chat as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Once again, thank you, Chetan, for your time. It has been a pleasure to have you here. So dear viewers, we hope you've enjoyed the story and many more exciting stories coming your way. Keep watching this space. This is the Economic Times Cutting Choice Story.